السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وآله وصحبه ومن والاه رب زدنا علما ولا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب Ya Allah, increase us in knowledge and cause not our hearts to deviate away from truth and guidance after you have shown them to us and grant us from your munificence a rahma. And the theme of this conference is a rahma. And I would like us to collect our thoughts and minds and think of this, that if we leave this conference with a change of, mart, of, of mind, I'm sorry, and of heart, where we have sensed that Rahma is very essential in the life of a Muslim, and we leave here with a resolve and commitment to reflect a rahmah to the best of our ability in every aspect of our lives, then we have learned something very important and then this conference would be termed as successful insha'Allah ta'ala. As we learned today in Khutbah al Jum'ah, that Rahmah is a universal law by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That He prescribed upon Himself to be Rahim. He made it, in other words, mandatory upon Himself to be Rahim. Kataba Rabbukum ala nafsihi Rahmah. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs, your Lord prescribed upon himself rahmah. And that he is ar rahman and ar rahim The loving, the one that owns love and compassion and mercy. And rahim and the one who dispenses of rahmah, gives it as well. And then we learned that he made it a universal law amongst his creatures and a divine attribute of his law that all his messengers and anbiya are to be ruhama. And thus the very message of Islam was summarized in one ayah, the way of that message. Remember the path by which to attain ubudiyya lillahi azza wa jal was always by rahma and therefore qawluhu azza wa jal wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alameen and this linguistic usage of ma illa in the arabic language implies hasr in other words the message of muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his way can be reduced and contained in one word, rahma to the worlds in plural. Human beings, all human beings, and jinns, and animals, and plants, as we shall see more, inshallah, tomorrow in Ar Rahma and the Sunnah. And said he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa rahmati wasi'at kulla shay. And my rahma encompasses every thing and the word kulla shay is very important here because it not only includes human beings but it includes things including constructs intellectual constructs including law kulla shay wa rahmati wasi'at kulla shay and thus as we learned he made it subhanahu wa ta'ala mandatory upon his creatures and thus said Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
speaking on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, لا يرحم الله من لا يرحم الناس. He who or she who does not show rahma to people should not expect rahma from Allah. And please do not translate rahma as mercy. Please. Rahma is more than mercy. Rahma is love, is compassion, is mercy altogether and more. Rahma comes from the root rahim in the Arabic language, which means the womb of a mother. And that's the best way I can translate it. The word, as I said, mercy, when it is translated to mean rahma, sometimes is even negative and derogatory and, and offensive in some cultures, including here. I don't need your mercy. I want your love, say they, which is true sometimes. Because many Muslims, unaware of this cultural reality and linguistic reality of the word mercy and of the word rahma, translate rahma all the time as mercy. I beg of you, don't do that. And that's why you hear someone saying, the word, you are about mercy, you're not about love. Because Muslims have not expressed themselves properly in their Quranic language, nor have they perhaps sometimes shown rahmah to the extent that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa taught and that the early people have shown it and that, oh, alhamdulillah, Ummah throughout generations relative to other nations had always shown. So this rahmah extend towards tashri'a itself. Rahmah in legislation. Rahmah in law. Because law in Islam is not only about justice. No. And as I said earlier today, only human-made justice is deprived from rahmah. Divine justice is characterized by rahmah. When rahmah is stripped from justice, from law, that is the hallmark of human law, of human justice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرِ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرِ Now, I'm going to mention a few ayat from the Qur'an and the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to elucidate the fact amongst our ulama, rahimahumullah, that this tashri'a, this divine tashri'a, this divine legislation is characterized by so Allah says in this ayah in Surah An-Nisa, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ Allah intends for you yusr, ease and facilitation, not usr, not hardship and difficulty. And that is the fruit and the product of rahmah, taysir in law, is the product of rahmah. Ease and facilitation in law is the product of rahmah. So Allah says, expressing the intent of the law, because Allah says, يُرِيدُ يُعَبِّرُ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ هُنَا عَنْ إِرَادَتِهِ فِي خَلْقِهِ بَلْ وَفِي التَّشْرِيعِ فَيَقُولُ يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمْ Allah expresses his intent behind his law. And behind his creation. And that very word expresses the intent of the law when he says it intends to ease and to facilitate, not to complicate and to make things hard. Unlike what many, if not most of us think sometimes, that if a solution to a problem is not complex and difficult, Mm, I doubt that this is Islamic. I feel uncomfortable. Please, Ya Shaykh, 
give me a solution that is challenging and hard, then I feel comfortable that it is shar'i and Islamic. Whereas Allah in the Quran says the opposite. And this is one ayah amongst many. Allah says, no, my shara is for ease and facilitation, not for hardship and complication. Definitely, many of you know, if not all of you know, and this would be a reminder therefore, that shurut al-taklif, in other words, the prerequisites for a person to be legally responsible in shara, in sharia. من شروط التكليف القدرة والعلم أي لا تكليف the rule says لا تكليف إلا بمقدور ومعلوم to the extent that the فقه law says there shall be no person legally responsible in other words in شرع except by that which is knowable and that which is within his or her capacity. What is this if it is not Rahmah? What is this if it is not Rahmah? Of course you all know and you should know the text that says لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها Allah will never hold any human being responsible by that which he or she cannot bear. And thus the rule says, there shall be no taklif except by that which is knowable and that which we are able to deliver. As an expression of his rahmah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, as a result of that, tashri'u al-rukhas in sharia. The legislation of concessions and laws for special circumstances is a, is a hallmark and a trademark and a feature of this sharia. In other words, when something is haram or something is, is wajib or obligatory, it is not under all circumstances. In other words, this deen is, a, is not, this sharia is not harfiya, is not literalist. Because if we follow the letter of the law only, then whatever the letter of the law says, it will be applied under all circumstances. But tashri'u al-rukhas, the very legislation in this deen, in this sharia, of concessions of rukhas, is definitive proof for the rahmah in sharia. And that... Rukhsa is not only on issues of ibadat, such as salah and siyam, but also in issues of adat and mu'amalat, in issues of trade, of business, of commerce, of politics, and on and on. For fiqh encompasses every aspect of life, by the way. There is nothing that can be outside the realm of fiqh. Fiqh in its study encompasses every matter of life. Sharia encompasses every matter of life. And thus, when you are traveling, as many of you are today, we are allowed to perform qasr and jama' of salah. What is that if it is not taysir, if it is not rahmah? When we are traveling, we are allowed not to fast. When we're sick, we're allowed not to fast. When we have hardships in performing our salah on time, sometimes, sometimes, I'm not giving fiqh here and details, we're allowed to perform jama' under some special, special circumstances if those circumstances lead to some sort of inconvenience or hardship, let alone necessity. What is that if it is not rahmah? And why reject the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And as a matter of fact, not only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the use of concessions part of law 
an integral part of law, but on the contrary, he loves yuhib. Subhanallah, look at this beautiful addition here. Inna Allaha yuhibbu an tu'ta rukhasa kama yuhibbu an tu'ta azaima. As Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught, that Allah indeed prefers and loves those who make use of his concessions as he loves those who adhere to his regularities, to the regular laws and the regular circumstances. He loves those who abide by them, but he loves those who make use of his concessions. See, this is not human. Do, do, you, do, you, do you follow me? Human beings don't do things this way. Human beings, you know, want things to be very hard. And we shall see more examples as we go along. That's why when it comes to necessities, فَمَنِ اضْطُرَّ غَيْرَ بَاغٍ وَلَا عَادٍ فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in most explicit terms with, uh, with, with we can, we can, when we read the ayah, we have to read it with, with gentleness and kindness because that's what it, we shouldn't say, فَمَنِ اضْطُرَّ غَيْرَ بَاغٍ وَلَا عَادٍ فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ It's an ayah of rahmah. You don't read an ayah of rahmah with anger. SubhanAllah. Like you don't read an ayah of warning like it is rahmah. Allah subhanahu wa says, وَمَنِ اضْطُرَّ غَيْرَ بَاغٍ وَلَا عَادٍ فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ And whosoever is necessitated, is led into a state of necessity, for such, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ That there is no blame upon this individual. Not only that, and therefore rather the law in, as, as, a, as a legal maxim, as a fiqhi qa'idah, says that necessities make lawful that which is readily available. Not only that, in necessities but in hajat. By the way, there is a difference between a necessity, a darura and haja. Please keep that in mind. A haja is less than darura. Need or convenience those two things are not equal to necessity. Haja without which we're going to be led to some sort of hardship. Necessity without which we're going to be led to something that is very serious, much more than hardship. Loss or partial loss of life or property or one of those five essential elements of Sharia. But the other law says, الْحَاجَةُ تُنَزَّلُ مَنْزِلَةَ الضَّرُورَةِ That is haja, convenience and need, when it becomes prevalent over a community or over a nation, not every one of them, but prevalent, then it has the rule of necessity. I know this law is very rarely quoted and rarely known and applied in legal reasoning. But this is very fundamental in the world of today. And a very fundamental expression of God's rahmah, of Allah's rahmah on his ibad through tashri'ah, through law, through legislation. When you are sick and the only way to get better is to make use of an intoxicant, assume that's the case, assume that's what, is, what a doctor or some doctors say. The rahmah of this deen requires that, yes, you may use that intoxicant for that purpose. And I have to give this example, though alhamdulillah Muslims know that intoxicants under regular circumstances are haram because they are harmful. But if to use them with some harm is going to bring more benefit to this body, and that's the only recourse or the best recourse, then it becomes halal. That's an expression of rahmah. You know the case of this person in, in I don't know what state, uh, at least as, as, the, as, the, as the reports tell us, who had problems with his eyesight, very serious problem. And the only thing that truly helps him in accordance to his statements and the statements of some doctor 
is that to smoke marijuana? The law here is no way. He will go to jail. And they are working on amending such things. But in this shara, because it was not human made and it is not harfi, under that circumstance, there is no doubt in our shara that it is halal. For as long as that is helping that individual and taken in measures that are proper and not abused under such circumstances of illness. And if a person in a state of duress, in a state of coercion, again the individual is allowed, whether this ilja or is called mukrih or non-mukrih, whether this state of duress is, is compelling or non-compelling, there is also rukhsa, there is concession, subhanallah. And that is a rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another very important point before I go to examples of adjudication and of qada and of, and of hudud and so on in criminal law is that the fact that law in Islam has maqasid, the fact that law has objectives. In other words, law is not simply an intellectual construct. But it has an intent behind it that is realistic, that is practical, to safeguard and to promote the well-being of human beings. It has a maqsad behind it. The fact that laws are subjected to their objectives, not only to their letter. If we contemplate this very carefully, we see that it is an expression of divine rahmah. That if, and that's why, for example, as I mentioned earlier, we have concessions. Because when we are not permitted to take an intoxicant, there is an objective behind that. There is an intent behind that. And that intent is what? To protect our lives, to protect our bodies, to protect our mind, to protect society from harm. But if not doing that at an individual level would necessarily or most likely lead to harm, then the text is not literalist. It has a maqsad behind it. It has an intent behind this. And that is definitively observing the needs of people. And that is definitively an expression of divine rahmah. Because the law did not Come, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not reveal this sharia for his own benefit, or did he? If anyone thinks so, by the way, that's a statement of kufr. Since he did not legislate it for his own benefit, and since he does not legislate in vain without purpose, then he must have legislated for the well-being of man. That's one of many arguments. Some are very textual and very explicit. Even when applying justice and practicing justice and in, in qada, in judicial procedures and in judicial proceedings, rahma is always there in this deen. Example. A person who kills another person intentionally and we have all the necessary proof and evidence and proof in this case is called in Islam it should be beyond doubt we call it in criminal law here beyond reasonable doubt and that is what Rasulullah taught and which is ijma' of the ulama of this ummah, and al-hududa tudra'u bi-shubuhat. That punishments in criminal law are to be averted by shubuhat, by doubts. If a doubt is introduced in the question, then there is no more, there is no more application of the had, of the punishment, for instance. 
Justice is sought. Justice is very important. But at the same time, because we're human beings that are fallible, if you find a shubha, and Rasulullah puts it in the affirmative statement, in the command form, idra'u al-hududa bi shubuhat avert indeed punishments by shubuhat, by doubts. In other words, the Muslim judge is to look for shubuhat, not to assume there is no shubha, but to look for shubuhat. That is the rahmah of this deen. Number two, in the same case, if I were to ask the audience here, is there, do you agree with death penalty? Does Islam condone death penalty? Is there death penalty in Islam? I know perhaps 99.9999 will answer, yes, of course. But let me, perhaps, allow me bother you. Are you ready to be bothered? My answer is no. Islam is not for the death penalty here. Uh -huh. Why? Death penalty is not equal to qasas. Many, many, many people make this mistake. Death penalty is not equal to qasas. Number one, death penalty, when you have a case of murder, then you have the state versus the individual versus the accused. In shara, it is not the state versus the accused. It is the family of the victim versus the accused. In this case, in sharia, this is a haq, a right of the individual, not a right of God, or better yet, a right in which there are both rights of God and rights of the individual, and the rights of the individual supersedes the right of God, as the fuqaha put it. And you know what? In Sharia, it is highly recommended to forgive and to accept diya instead. What they call loosely as blood money. Which, yeah, it's not blood money. It's dia. And if the guardians or the parents of the victim forgive, then by law there is no had. In the death penalty law, whether the parents forgive and the guardians forgive or society forgives or not, it does not matter the person will burn. That is not shara. Shara, once they forgive, and the ayah of the Quran is there in Surah Al-Baqarah and others, when the guardians and the parents forgive, that's it. There is no had. This is not like death penalty. Furthermore, of this rahmah. By the way, there was an instance when a person committed a murder, killed his son, somebody killed somebody's son. And then he was brought in, uh, in a rope by the parent of the victim to Rasulullah and Rasulullah listened to both parties and the person agreed indeed, consented that he committed that murder. Rasulullah asked him, forgive. Forgive so that this man is not going to be killed by had, by qasas. You have that right. But the first thing he told him, forgive. And the man said no. And then he pulled the murderer to take him to, with the people to execute him. Then Rasulullah says to him, this is an authentic hadith, Go then, you are like him. Then he went on and then the companions went to him, Did you hear what Rasulullah said? 
He said, no. What did he say? He said, he said this. إِنَّكَ مِثْلُ You're like him. He said, did he say that? He said, yes. He said, then I forgive. And accepted the diya. And accepted the diya. This is the application of justice with rahmah. And even the diya, now the diya usually is mandated in, the, in, in a case when there is no execution, or when a person has committed a murder that is, uh, that is inadvertent, that he did not mean it, or she did not mean it. It was a mistake. And assume that it's proven like that in a court of, of sharia, in a court of law. Then in this case, there is no imprisonment for 25 years, or for 5 years, or for 10 years. The first rule of law is diyan that the person accepts uh, compensation from the accused or the person who had committed that unintentional crime, murder. But look, rahma here is shown again where? That the diya in this case, ala al it was legislated that who is going to pay this diya? Not one individual, the person who unintentionally committed the murder, but the entire aqila, the entire family of the tribe, or the entire tribe on the male side of the person who committed that unintentional crime. وَيَقُولُ الْفُقَهَاءَ تَخْفِيفًا عَنِ الْجَانِي in order to ease and to facilitate the burden of the person who unintentionally committed that murder. This is rahma or what? Spread over three years to be paid in a time spread over three years. Is this rahma or what? Besides other fiqhi lessons that we learn from this, I'm focusing on this concept of rahma. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the case of Hiraba, a person who, who intentionally and maliciously turns against Allah and his messenger and killing Muslims and killing people. This is one of the worst crimes you can ever commit. Allah says about that in Surah Al-Ma'idah. إنما جزاء الذين يحاربون الله ورسوله ويسعون في الأرض فسادا أن يقتلوا أو يصلبوا أو تقطع أيديهم وأرجلهم من خلاف أو ينفوا من الأرض ذلك لهم خزي في الدنيا ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم إلا الذين تابوا إلا الذين تابوا من قبل أن تقدروا عليهم فاعلموا أن الله غفور رحيم this is, by the way, the core ayah in the Qur'an that the ulama use to debate the following question, which is usually unimaginable in these proportions in, in, in human shara. Namely, what is the place of repentance in averting punishment? And here, all the ulama agree. That in this case of Hiraba, like those people in the time of Rasulullah who were granted sanctuary by Rasulullah and honored and given provisions and sustenance, who went with the shepherd, killed the shepherd, crucified the shepherd, took out his eyes, tortured him, and stole the property. This is this case. That case in which this text came. Yet Allah, look, subhanAllah, Allah in his rahmah says, but if such people, and he speaks of their punishment, but if such people express tawbah before you get to them, then know that Allah is oft forgiven, oft rahim. And thus the ulama agree that they will not be executed, they will not be killed, that maximum punishment will not be applied to them. And since this is the case in Hiraba, what about theft, sariqa rather? What about zina? What about 
other practices that are considered criminal in Shara. Well, first of all, in Shara, there is a distinction, as I said earlier, between Haqqullah and Haqqul Abd. The right of God, the right of Allah, and the right of the individual. And sometimes the right of the community is called the right of God to emphasize its importance. And it is well established in our shara that when it comes to the right of Allah, that that right is forgiven by repentance, by true repentance. When it comes to the right of the individual, it is forgiven only by the permission of the aggrieved party only by the permission and the forgiveness of the injured party. So if you have a case in which both are there and there is genuine tawbah, then the shara leads and the qadi will of course look into the situation very carefully and the court will look into the situation very carefully. And then if there is genuine tawbah, the right of Allah is forgiven and the right of the individual is forgiven only if the aggrieved party, the injured party, the individual injured party, for instance, or the individual injured forgives. Now, in the case of Sariqa, um, Sariqa is usually translated as what? Theft, which is a very bad translation. Sariqa is not theft, right? Every Sariqa is theft, but not every, every theft is a sariqa. And we don't have the time to go into those details as to why. And that there are certain actions, criminal actions that are called theft, but are not subject to the maximum punishment that sariqa is to be subjected to. Now in the case of sariqa, what if a person performs tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? returns the property, will the hand still be amputated? Assuming we have definitive evidence. The answer, first of all, by the majority of the scholars, that if repentance is there and is shown by returning the property, before the issue arrives to the court, then the rahma, the divine rahma, requires forgiveness. But they have differed as to even after the issue was in front of the court. Some ulama say, no, we don't. Other ulama say, yes, we do. And why, we shall see in just a moment. First of all, my very dear brothers and sisters, when it comes to this concept of justice and criminal law, many of us have the wrong attitude sometimes. When somebody commits a, a crime or commits something that is heinous, we seem to enjoy what he does. Or we, we seem rather to enjoy rather the consequences of that, of, of that crime as punishment. We delight in the punishment of that individual. First of all, Rasulullah taught that this is not the characteristic of a mu'min. Al-mu'minu la yatashaffa fi masaibi ghayrihi bal wa fi masaibi aduwi. You know, the mu'min does not delight in the tragedies and the pain and the suffering and the, and the pain and the harm that befall others, even if they were his own enemies. And number two, Rasulullah taught in what is authentic, مَنْ سَتَرَ مُسْلِمًا سَتَرَهُ اللَّهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Whosoever covers up the fault of a Muslim, including such faults that are criminal in the shari'i, context and they were not made public that the first reaction of a Muslim towards especially another Muslim and another fellow human being in general as long as it is not public and audacious then is to cover up to hide not to expose so whosoever hides the faults of others said Rasulullah Allah will hides will hide his fault in the day of judgment that's very important. What is this if it is not a rahma? It is not you go and spy on people and they'll go, you have to tell the court what happened. That is not divine shara, that may be human shara. 
not divine shara. As a matter of fact, in concealment, in concealing the mistake, the ulama speak of the probability of tawbah. In other words, how may we sometimes detect a probable indicator of tawbah if passage of time elapses with passage of time and the person did not come out public with that and a lot of time has passed, then that is an indicator of tawbah. That would be called a shubha. So refined were they by the shara, by Rasulullah sallallahu that even as Abu Hanifa, for example, rahimahullah, and some of his school uh, ulama argued that if the evidence is delayed too long to be brought to court, then that is reason for removing, for averting the head. And that he calls a shubha. That is shubha tul ithbat, shubha in evidence. Not only that, he argues and others, rahimahumullah, that if even the execution of the verdict of punishment of maximum punishment is delayed for no compelling reason, then that should be ground for averting the head. Because he argues the passage of time brings an element of doubt, of small probability even though, that the person had already committed tawbah. Is this rahmah or what? It is related uh, to this one. Please forgive me. I'm not sure of the level of authenticity of this text. Every text I say, I know, inshallah, it is authentic. When I say, I don't know, I don't know. In this, though reported by some ulama, such as Sheikh Abu Zahra, in his beautiful work on criminal law, that in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, a young man was brought to, to Umar who had committed a sariqah. And uh, he ordered that the hand be amputated. And then his mother pleaded, Ya Amir al muminin please, my son, this is the first time that this ever happened to him. Please, Ya Amir al muminin Then it is related that Umar said, radiallahu ta'ala an, Inna Allah arhamu and yakshifa Sutra abdihi li awwali marra. Which means, a oh woman indeed, Allah is much more rahim, much more compassionate to expose the mistake or the sin of his abd because of one time. Go. Rahma in applying justice. It is not without rahma. When there is no rahma, that is human law. That is not divine law. Justice is paramount. But justice without rahma and without hikmah is not divine either. Is deficient. As a matter of fact, two more texts and I quit and we can spend hours, wallahi, enjoying the beauty of the shara and the rahma in this shara. In a case of, of, let's say, zina, sexual illicitness, sexual promiscuity, to commit sex outside marriage, is this halal or haram? Are you doubting? <laughs> no, not because I said earlier <laughs> something about sariqa, then you're going to doubt this one. هذا معلوم من الدين بالضرورة. On this issue, there is no difference between alim and non-alim. This is haram, haram, haram. Kabira tun kabira tun kabira. And the punishment for it will is severe in the day of judgment. The punishment is severe in the day of judgment. And I need not talk about the, the pain and the harm and the disasters that zina causes in society. We can quantify by dollars and by otherwise for those who are interested in such research, in such language how harmful zina is 
to the individual and to society. That's why it is haram. It is haram. And of course the requirement of evidence is very stringent and very strict for eyewitnesses. Can you imagine? For eyewitnesses witnessing the sexual act. Excuse me. Please forgive me. Not the flirting. The sexual intercourse. They witnessed four of them. In other words, this person must be crazy who is doing this thing with billah. Not only immoral and, 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 and with nonsense, but has no ihtiram, no, no respect to, to public and to others and to the feelings of anyone to be witnessed by four eyewitnesses. Because if only three come and say, we have witnessed this person or these persons committing zina, you know what happens? Those three persons will be whipped. Yes. Either four or no one. And if there is one or two or three that come and say, we have seen this person, then the regular application of the law is they are going to be whipped if there is no fourth person to testify that way. And so on. Anyways, the point is if there is tawbah, would the application of law here also include zina? When tawbah is sincere and the law and the court and the judge knows and feels to his shar'i discretion in looking at the evidence and the state of affairs, would he have the leeway to say this person will not be punished? And of course, we don't apply shar'a nowadays anyways. So this still remains a theoretical question as far as we are concerned in this society and almost everywhere. Well, again, the ulama are, is it before he was caught or she was caught or after they were caught? After they were caught, meaning after the case arrived to the court with all the evidence and so on. Here, again, the ulama differ. One requires, one group of ulama requires that the person express true repentance with its signs before the issue came to court. The others say it does not matter. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> there was a man, this hadith is authentic, reported by Imam al-Nasai and others. And a man came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam to the masjid in Medina. He said, Ya Rasulullah, asabtu haddan. And he was very explicit. He said, Asabtu Haddan. In other words, I have committed such crime in the, in the balance of Sharia that requires Had, which requires that physical punishment. What it was, the man didn't say. Asabtu Haddan. It could be either Sariqa or Zina or murder, in which the Quranic texts are very explicit about had. And Rasulullah turns away from him, subhanAllah, because now he realizes the gravity of the situation and wants rahmah to prevail. And the man came. He turns away from him. The man goes. Ya Rasulullah, asabtu haddan fa'aqimu alayh. Rasulullah turns away from him. He doesn't want to hear this. He said it a third time. Rasulullah turns away from him. And then the salah is called for. Al iqama for salah was called for. Rasulullah goes, leads salah, and after completion of salah, the man comes to Rasulullah again. SubhanAllah. What is this indicating? I leave that to you. Again, Ya Rasulullah, asabtu haddan fa'aqimu alayhi. I've committed a crime that necessitates had. Here I am. 
then Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in his wisdom, tells him, "Did you perform salah with us?" After seeing, he read his profile. He read his inner being, his psychological profile, his attitude, his sincerest tawbah. And then he judged وسلم, and told him, did you attend salah with us? He said, yes. He said, go, idhab faqad ghafar Allah lak. Go. Allah has forgiven you. I know you and me probably would not have done that at all. No, we would not have done that at all. That is human justice. Or that is human application of justice and of law. One final example I said too, in the case of zina. And it is okay for me to say it because this had is not applied anyways. But for us to appreciate the beauty and the specialness of the shara. And that it is only our fault when rahma is stripped from our hearts that we are subjected to you know what. Because when there is no rahma, rahma will not be granted to us. Perhaps one of many reasons why we suffer from what we suffer is that rahma is taken away from our daily activities and from our appreciation of the shara. This final example, again in an authentic hadith, reported by uh, many scholars, Ibn Majah included, and it is an authentic hadith. A woman, very early in Fajr, went to the masjid. She was alone. By the way, it is halal for a woman to go to a masjid alone. And in this hadith, a woman went to the masjid alone for Salatul Fajr. As the text says, Fi sawadi subh, while it, is, it was still dark uh, in, in, in the Fajr time. And she was attacked by a man. She was alone, and she was attacked by a man, who raped her. She was screaming. A man was passing by and heard her screaming, came running to her rescue. Remember those days there were no lights, huh? It's all dark outside if you have ever been into a desert, huh? And especially when there is no moon. You can't see the light of the moon. It's very dark. So a man came to her rescue and it's very dark. The aggressor runs, runs away and and the person who came to her rescue is there and the woman is screaming and screaming and he's trying to calm her down, the woman is screaming and then many more people overheard her and came running to her rescue, a group of companions, a group of Muslims. And they see the situation there in the dark, they catch them all, they catch the man and he says, no, it's not me, I'm innocent, I came to help her, uh, to help her. she didn't see anything, she couldn't. Distinguished. She said, no, he's a liar. It is he. And the man was there, the third one, the aggressor also. So they all went to Rasulullah the entire group, and told him what happened. Regardless to go through the details of what evidence means here and how to collect it and so on and so forth to make the story very brief. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa adjudicated and said, انطلقوا به فرجموه Take him and stone him to death. I'm not going to into the details here of all of that. Then the man who committed really the crime said no. No, please, it is I. It is I who committed that crime, not he. Here I am. Wow. 
to make the story very short, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says to that man who originally committed the crime, and I'm just abbreviating here the story, and said to him, go, فَقَدْ غَفَرَ اللَّهُ لَكَ Leave, Allah forgave you. And then he said a good word to the person who rescued her and also good word to the woman. That is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Umar ibn al-Khattab was there. <laughs> ah, you know what that means. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu arda. But if you knew Umar, when he became Khalifa, subhanallah, he was the closest in fiqh to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That man became something else. Umar radiallahu ta'ala and was there and said, Ya Rasulullah, urjum alladhi zana, aw alladhi a'tarafa biz zina. Ya Rasulullah, at least stoned to death the person who confessed. And there is a confession here, it's clear. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, no. La. Li'annahu qad taba ila Allah. Because he truly repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many fuqaha, let alone regular people, feel very uncomfortable. So one alim said to them, I understand if your hearts feel uncomfortable. إذا لم تتسع لها قلوبكم نعم فذلك أولى لأن قلب عمر بن الخطاب لم يتسع لها I understand if you feel that way because Umar himself رضي الله تعالى عنه وأرضاه his heart was not that wide to be that رحيم but but the رحمة of Allah was more than enough. The Rahmah of Allah could contain even that. Not the Rahmah of the best, even of individuals, but the Rahmah of Allah could contain that. So the Qadi here, Rasulullah as a Qadi, applied the law with such Rahmah. Because this person who came now and confessed that he truly was the perpetrator, he asked for repentance and for forgiveness. He was ready to die and to save the life of that innocent Muslim. All of it, all of this cannot be disregarded by wise law, let alone by divine law. So this is a powerful example, not only of rahmah, but of hikmah, but of maslaha. And I therefore conclude by saying in this presentation about the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permeating every, every, kulla shay, including law and the application of law in all aspects of life, I conclude by, by a very powerful statement of one of the uh, most powerful ulama of this ummah, amongst many others, summarizing, in other words, that which perhaps most ulama, most enlightened ulama of old would agree to, coming from the teaching of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, defining or describing sharia, and I said it earlier in khutbah, I believe I did, and I remind you of it and myself here as well in conclusion. He said, rahimahullah, and talking about sharia, and then he comes to the point where he says, wa kullu mas'alatin, خرجت عن العدل إلى الجور وعن الرحمة إلى ضدها وعن المصلحة إلى المفسدة وعن الحكمة إلى العبث فليست من الشرع وإن أدخلت فيه بالتأويل He says رحمه الله summarizing I believe not only رحمة but the other elements that are characteristics of شريعة uh, namely adl, justice, hikmah, wisdom and farsightedness and, and purpose and maslaha and the well-being of people when he said and therefore speaking about sharia and therefore every issue every issue in this life 
that we deal with and the way we address it. If it is taken from justice and fairness to injustice and unfairness, or from rahmah to the opposite of rahmah, yes, or from maslaha, from the well-being of people, to their to the opposite of it, to the mafsad, to that which is harmful and corruptive. Or from hikmah, purpose, law has purpose, to abath, to no purpose. And discernible purpose, of course, he means. Then it is not of shara, even if it were made to be so through interpretations. Please, my very dear brothers and sisters, reflect on these words, you know, this last sentence. And leave here, I do pray, leave here with not only a changed heart, but a changed mind. The mind without heart is terrible, is harsh. And the heart without mind is blind. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله العظيم لي ولكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته تكبير تكبير